Hello everyone and welcome back to our class on the life of David. Today we are in lesson 18 entitled David and Absalom part 1. We're going to be in our Bibles in 2 Samuel chapter 15 and 16 as we look at this study today. In our last class we noticed that David's family was, was falling apart. Uh, we see Amnon's rape of Tamar, David's inactivity, Absalom's murder of Amnon, uh, David not speaking to Absalom for five years, and th this all ended in chapter 14 with, with Absalom having coming back to Israel, having seen the king and, and reconciling with him. You see verse 33 of, of chapter 14, Joab went to the king and told him he summoned Absalom. So he came to the king and bound himself on the, on, I'm sorry, bound himself on his face on the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. So by appearance, it's like, okay, everything's back to normal. Everything's fine. Everything is the way it should be. What, we're learned, what we will learn in the upcoming chapters is how Absalom's reconciliation with David was all just part of his plan. All part of his bigger plan. Because the distance between David and Absalom had grown so great that Absalom cares nothing for his father. And what we see thus here is the fulfillment of Nathan's uh, prophecy from the Lord as a punishment of David's sin when he said in chapter 12 and verse 11, I will raise up against you from your own home evil. And so someone from his own house is going to rise up against him. And that's what we see the beginning of here in chapter 15 and 16 of, of 2 Samuel. But here's what happens. Absalom begins to to unfold his plan, to, to begin his plan of, of hurting his father and stealing his kingdom. And so he does several things to, to steal the kingdom from David. One is that he listens to the people's complaints uh, while complaining about his father, the king. That's in verse 3 through 6 when it says, Absalom would say to him, See, your claims are good and right, but there's no man designated by the king to hear you. And Absalom would say, Oh, that I were the judge of the land. Then every man with a dispute or cause might come to me, and I would give him justice. And whenever a man came near to pay homage to him, he would put out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. Thus Absalom did to all of Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom start the hearts, stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Essentially what he's saying is, no, nobody, nobody cares about what you've got to say. Nobody up there in that big palace so far away, no one's going to listen to you. No one cares about you. Oh, I do, though. Oh, but I do. Oh, that, that someone would, would see the value of my wisdom and let me occupy the throne. I would listen to you. I would care for you. Those, those politic, uh, politicians, those royals on the throne, they won't listen to you, but I would. And so he listens to their complaints while at the same time complaining about the king. And so he is creating this distance in the heart of Israel and David. You also notice during this time he starts to gather supporters because if this is going to work, if his plan is going to work, he's going to have he's going to have to have enough support behind him. And so uh, it starts small. Verse one, you see, there's 50 men, but through his deception and scheming, it grew and it grew. In fact, in verse 10, he had spies throughout all the twi uh, all the tribes of Israel. Verse 10, he invited 200 men with him. In verse 11, um, though they went innocently, his rebellion uh, was not stopped. And he turned Ahithophel on his side, who was David's counselor. In verse 12, um, Bathsheba is the daughter of Eliam. At 2 Samuel, verses 11 and verse 3. I'll see it, 1 Chronicles 3 and verse 5. And so Ahithophel is listed as Eliam's father, therefore making him Bathsheba's grandfather. And then interesting that now... Absalom has Bathsheba's grandfather on his side. And so with this large report, they announced that Absalom is the king in Hebron in verse 10. Hebron was the, the heart of Judah. That's where David became king long ago. And so now Absalom's following in dad's footsteps, announcing himself as king. And so he was going to need this strong support, a large following if this is going to work. And so he carried on this deception of of stealing the hearts of the people. Oh, that there was someone who would listen to you. No one up there cares for you, but I care for you. 
He was the first one. He would meet them as they came into Jerusalem before they even made it, made it to David. He had it well thought out in his mind. He's been carrying this on for four years. Well, what's to say about David? What's to say about the king? I mean, how could he remain so unaware of what his son Absalom is doing all these years, these four years? Here again is a father who is so out of touch with his kids. And it tells us that there, within the heart, is this growing dissatisfaction with David's reign. Well, once the word finally gets to David, that Absalom has now announced himself as the king, uh, he tells his family to leave, to flee, verses 13 and 14. Because he knew that Absalom would overtake them and there would be bloodshed. That David was, was thinking about his, his family and thinking about the people. And so David takes his family, he leaves 10 concubines behind it to keep house, and then he leaves Jerusalem. He gets out of there. Well, one of the men that proved helpful to David was this man named Ittai the Gittite. You see in chapter 15, verses 19 to 22. He's, he's from Gath, very hometown of Goliath. Uh, he proves really helpful to David during this time. And this is important. There's going to be some people during this time that did not side with Absalom who remain loyal to David and helpful during this time of great unrest. And this Ittai is one of them. David tells him to return home rather than to, to follow him. But, but Ittai says in verse 21, Wherever my lord the king may be, whether for death or for life, there also your servant will be. Well, that's a friend. That's a friend who's, who's willing to stand by your side. I mean, if the whole world uh, turns against you, I'm going to stand right next to you. I'll stand at your defense. Uh, when, everything, when everything else seems to fall and to fail, I'm there. I'm there with you, and I'm going to support you. Um, there's a precious few who you can give a call and say, yeah, in a moment's notice, whatever it is, I'm there with you. And that's this guy. So David, as he took, as, as he and his people left, his supporters in verse 23, you know what happens. As David and his family and the few that were going with him leave, those who still supported David, those who still loved David, started to weep. They wept. Also in David's uh, corner is Zadok and Abiathar. They were Levites. Uh, they were priests. Uh, they carried the ark with David. Uh, Zadok felt that the ark belonged with the Lord's anointing. And that's an incredible statement. That's an incredible statement. But there's even more an incredible statement from David. Because you look in verse 25. Down in verse 25 of chapter 15. It says here, Abiathar came up. And as verse 24. Behold, Zadok came with him all the Levites bearing the Ark of the Covenant. And sat down the Ark of the Covenant. Until the people had passed out of the city. Then the king said to Zadok, carry the Ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me back. Let me see both it and his dwelling place. And so David, this incredible statement, he understood that the possession of the ark does not guarantee God's blessings. Even the ark is with us doesn't mean that we have God's favor. And so it belongs in the capital. It belongs where God's people is. It is the symbol of God's rule over the nation. And so... No matter who the king might be, who's on the throne, it needs to be this, this visual, firm reminder that God is still king over Israel. And God is still present over Israel. And so David recognized the greater battle here, the, the, the greater importance than having the Lord's favor through this ark with him. No, no the ark remains in Jerusalem, the, the capital of God's people. God is still king, even if David is not. God is still here, no matter who's on the throne. And he also recognized that he's going to receive whatever it is the Lord's going to give. And if I receive favor from the Lord, good. If not, I'll receive punishment. Um, he's a man who, at this time, has been so humbled through life choices is that he's willing to receive whatever it was the Lord was going to give him, whether good or ill, for his choices. And so here, his, his friends who are willing to do whatever the king commands, even if it goes against their wishes, go along with David's, um, gave David's desires. And so catch, if you will, the, the picture that's presented in verse 30, where it says, But David went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went, barefoot, with his head covered. And all the people who were with him covered their heads. And as they went up weeping, they went along as they went. They were weeping along as they went. 
Can you get the picture there? Here is, is this mighty king of Israel. And he's barefoot, head covered, crying out loud. Doesn't seem very kingly, does it? Where he is ascending in his mourning, this Mount of Olives certainly makes us think about a different king who ascended that same Mount of Olives and also wept. Wept greatly because of the burden that was placed upon him to take the sins of the world upon himself, dying as a sin sacrifice on Calvary. It's an interesting picture that here David is ascending this mount. Hundreds of years before day, before Christ, the descent of David will do the same. Someone else who was in David's corner was Hushai. Hushai was uh, he was an archite. He's mentioned in Joshua 16. Uh, that the area he is from is mentioned in Joshua 16 and verse 2. It's on the border of Ephraim and Benjamin. Um, but rather than having this man named Hushai accompany him, he sends him back to to Israel to deceive Absalom uh, to get information to David through Zadok and Abiathar. He's going to be this important spy to try and keep David informed and to try and and slow down to frustrate the plans of Absalom as much as much as possible. And so here's a true friend offering his true support to David in a time when when he was on short supply of friends and support. What's interesting is that in verse 31, David prayed to God to confuse Ahithophel. And then the next verse we read about Hushai. Sometimes we, we don't see about that. Sometimes we don't see God answering prayers uh, through people. But here God answers David's prayer literally through a person. Uh, have you thought that perhaps uh, the answer to your prayers might be a person, found in a person? You pray for wisdom. For patience, for strength, for help, maybe that's going to come through someone, someone in your life. Uh, have we been pushing away the answer, overlooking the answer to our prayers? Um, have you ever thought that maybe you are the answer to someone's prayers? Uh, don't uh, overestimate the good that you can do. I, I love Second Corinthians 7 verse 6 where, where Paul says that, that God comforted us through the coming of Titus. And so that may be you. You may be the source of wisdom or patience or help or strength or guidance, whatever someone's praying for. The answer may not be just patience put in the heart, but it may be a person who can teach patience or a person who can encourage um, self-control or a person who can instill wisdom. We may be the answer to someone's prayer. I think it's fascinating that David prays to confuse Absalom's counselor, Ahithophel, and the very next verse we read of this helpful friend, Hushai, who David sends to accomplish that very task. But well, as David and his his supporters continued to flee, they came across they, they come across this guy named Shimei. And there's a couple things we know about him. We know he's from the Sam, the family of Saul from verse five. Um, he's one of Saul's relatives. Uh, it's obvious he's angry. He comes out uh, cursing, cursing David, cursing the king. This is in chapter sixteen, cursing David, cursing the king. Um, Questions why. Why, why is he so angry at David? Well, I mean, it's obvious he's angry at David. He's cursing David. He's throwing stones at David. So it's angry. It's obvious his anger is directed towards David. The question is why. When you look at verse 8, it's, it's obvious that he resented David as the king, as being king. Uh, he blamed David for Saul's death and the death of Saul's sons. Uh, you notice his curses in verse 7. He calls him worthless. Uh, in verse 8, he claims that um, his misfortunes, is due to the evils that he has committed. That David's misfortunes are just a repayment on the evils that he has committed. And the amazing thing is how David responds. One of his mighty men is standing right there at Bishai, and he says, hey, I'll, I'll chop off his head. You just say the word, I'll take off his head. David wouldn't allow it. No, David didn't know whether the Lord had, had moved Shimei to curse him or not, but he planned to accept it. He planned to accept what was happening to him. Uh, what David was facing with Absalom was far worse than this miserable man cursing him. And there's a lesson for us that uh, we see the effect of bitterness on a person's heart. Um, anger, anger, bitterness, wrath, uh, they can become deceiving, destructive emotions if we let them run loose in our minds and in our hearts. This anger that this Shimei is feeling is not new. It's been sitting there for years because Saul died a long time ago. And 
that oftentimes is the case. So often we let something that happened so long ago in the past, we just let it sit there and it grows and it grows and it grows until one day it just explodes. And this guy's not thinking about it. He's not thinking about it in wisdom because had David been at his lowest, how easy it would have him to been to just pick up a sword and kill him or have his men do it. It was not smart for him to, to insult the king. It was not right for him to insult the king because here's the reality. Even if David was guilty, which he wasn't, even if David was guilty of taking Saul's life, is throwing stones going to bring Saul back? Is cursing him and belittling him, kicking dust in him, is that going to make Jonathan and the sons come back? No. Is making someone feel bad going to make you feel better? And the answer is no. No. But realize from David's perspective, that there are going to be times in our life when people will come and they'll kick us when we're down. They'll come and they'll, they'll cast stones at us when we're at our lowest. And perhaps it's nothing more than Satan seizing an opportunity to try and, and hurt us when we're low. But we learn from David that not every injury, not every insult, not every harm is worth pursuing. Um, he could have ended this land, man's life without a word. Just, But he let him live. He let him live and he let him insult him. It's a lesson for us, I think. You think about Proverbs 26, verse 4, do not answer a fool according to his folly. Uh, some people lash out at a place of, of hurt. They act, they speak, they, they lash out of this anger and this hurt. But rather than slinging mud back, be strong. Be strong. Lean on the Lord. Look to the Lord for help uh, in tough times. And be careful of friends who are willing to swing swords at our defense. Um or on our defense. It may seem like a big shy that they're willing to do good, but two wrongs don't make a right. And so it may feel good if someone says, I'll go take care of him. I'm going to take care of him. No one treats my friend that way. I'm going to go take care of him. I'm going to beat him down for you. That's the wrong response. And it may seem like they're defending us or helping us or standing up for us, but they're doing, they're doing evil. Two wrongs don't make a right. We don't overcome evil with evil. We overcome evil with good. And that's just... Taking the life here would have been just as wrong as Jimmy and I cursing David along the way. Well, chapter 16 ends, and it ends with Hushai gaining Absalom's trust. Absalom seeks uh, advice from Ahithophel, who tells him to go into David's concubines in public, and that's exactly what he did. He, he wanted to make himself completely odious to his father, just a disgrace to David and his family's name. And so all of all of Israel would see this. It's out in the open, this this uh, fornicating with, with David's um, concubine. And so all of Israel would see that this revolt is is completed. Um, they would also see that there's no reconciliation at this point. It was out of the question between these two because of what Absalom has done. Here's the thing. In the midst of all of this, David running, David fleeing, um, losing the kingdom, losing his son. In the midst of all this, you look at Psalm 3. Here's the thing. Others saw his defeat. Others saw David's defeat. Uh, David saw what he had done in facing Goliath. It was God's victory. I want you to notice here what, in Psalm 3, when David arrives during this period of his life. It's Psalm 3, this is what he writes while he's on the run from Absalom. O oh Lord, how many are my foes? Many are, are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I woke again for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. God is my shield. He is the lifter of my head. He is my sustainer. He is my salvation. He, David goes back to what makes him a man after God's own heart, and that is his full and complete reliance on God. He is putting his trust on the Lord. 
They're in a tough place. They're facing difficulties, difficulties with his home, difficulties with the nation. David trusted in the Lord to help him overcome his enemies and to be his rock, his salvation. And so David endured the hardship of this rebel son. Um, he, he endured the hardship of losing the kingdom, of losing the nation, of, of on the run again, again he's on the run. This time from his own son. He endured all of that through placing his strength, his trust, his hope in his God. And if you're going to make it through the valleys, if you're going to make it through the hard times, you have to learn to place your strength and your hope and your trust not in yourself, not in people, not in a church, in God. The battle belongs to the Lord. What a sobering and powerful lesson we see from David. Well, join with us again. We're going to complete this series of studies, at least on Absalom. We're going to complete the story of Absalom in the next study as we see what happens with this conflict between David and his son. I hope you come back and join us again. Until then, take care. Have a wonderful day.